Hi. Let me mention a, an incident that took place to introduce us to our topic for today, the great controversy and social reform. Dr. Leonard Bailey, who um, for many years has been the head of the surgery department at Loma Linda University, had already as a young physician, surgeon, transplanted a baboon heart into a human for the first time in human history. He then developed a very uh, major program, an infant heart transplantation. There was a meeting of the American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature, which happens every year. About 10,000 people gather, and it took place in Orange County. And Dr. Bailey was invited to be on a panel. My brother, who at that time was the head of surgery before Dr. Leonard Bailey, uh, went with me to this conference. We sat together. It was a large plenary session with hundreds of people in attendance. And Kenneth Vox, who was well known as a bioethicist and a theologian, he had come up with the idea of a multi-volume series on health medicine and the various religious traditions. He was speaking, and he said, Dr. Bailey, you could not come to terms with the inevitability of death. You went to extraordinary lengths to keep profoundly sick infants from dying. But, he said, I think that death is a part of the natural order, and let me illustrate that and how deeply I believe that. I had an infant son who developed a very profoundly disabling condition. My wife and I, after praying, uh, very went hesitantly but very calmly to the physician of our son and asked him to cease efforts to keep my son alive, and my son died. He then turned to Dr. Bailey and he says, I believe you, Dr. Bailey, would never have made my decision and would have fought against death. I could feel my brother, the surgeon, stirring and very tense. And certainly, <clears throat> Dr. Bailey did respond by saying, Ken, I would hope that you would have left, have let me fight to save your son. That little incident, it seems to me, really does illustrate how Adventist physicians, I think, have traditionally understood what they're doing. That is to say that Seventh-day Adventists steeped in the biblical imagery of healing as a part of the combat, the conflict, the controversy between good and evil, between disease and healing, uh, is, is all a part of God's way of responding to rebellious powers in the great controversy. I remember another meeting, uh, also of the American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature, when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a psychiatrist who had worked with physicians in Chicago to develop uh, the whole idea of the stages of dying. And she'd written a very uh, popular book on death and dying. She came to a plenary session again, a time when all the delegates uh, attending these uh, meetings were invited to attend. And she talked about her understanding of caring for the dying, including letting them go and helping them to come to a stage of acceptance of their death. I saw people who had tears running down their face all around me. Now, I think that we uh, are coming to a third image in our course that is very powerful. The first, let's review uh, just for a moment. The first looked on disease as corruption and defilement, and health as a pure bodily temple. And so healing was a way of taking this corrupted, defiled body and purifying it getting rid of those things that corrupted it. And we saw that that was uh, something that was very important 
right after the disappointment of 1844, but has continued, as all these metaphors have, uh, into our own day. The second one uh, looks on um, disease as being out of sync with God's natural order, uh, somehow not being in tune with what is. And so uh, health is to um, be in conformity to God's laws and to live with those laws, in step with those laws. And healing is obedience then to those laws and learning how to be obedient to those laws. And we've been looking for a couple of weeks at how that metaphor has been very important early in the Adventist uh, experience, but continuing uh, up till this day. Now this, this particular metaphor of the great controversy certainly existed in the 19th century, in the early days of Adventism. And disease here is oppression by unjust powers over human beings, twisting and turning and corrupting their lives. But it is the lives of whole communities that are being corrupted. Indeed, it's the whole universe that is being corrupted. And each individual who is unhealthy is a person who has been uh, found by the powers of evil. And what is healing? Healing is the struggle against those oppressive uh, evil powers. Now, we appreciate all of these metaphors, but we're going to spend a few weeks talking about this last understanding of what is disease, what is health, and what is healing. Now let's take as an illustration smoking. Uh, that's certainly, uh, in terms of behavior, a very important part of the Seventh-day Adventist experience. And we've seen that smoking was seen as something that defiled the bodily temple, right? And that if you wanted to go straight to heaven as the early Adventists who were still Millerites, remember up until about 1859, uh, if you wanted to go to heaven because you were not going to die, Christ would in fact return, then you had to get rid of tobacco, which was defiling the bodily temple. Healing as purification. But then we understood as time went on that smoking was understood to be in contradiction to the laws of God. And um, the ideal was to be in conformity with those laws. And if you're smoking, you're out of conformity. And so healing is to learn to be obedient to the laws of nature, the laws of health, all of whom were all of which were God's laws. But now you can understand, and the Adventists did understand, smoking and drinking, because we'll eventually, not this week, but next week, talk about temperance and the Adventists. These were the result of economic powers oppressing uh, human beings and leading them into sin and into disobedience of God's law. But what was healing? Healing was combating these institutions and oppressive powers in society, economic, political, that were corrupting the whole nation. And so healing is the healing of the nations and involved in the healing of the nations. For Adventists who understood the great cosmic battle between good and evil was to engage with those powers that were oppressing not only individuals, but whole communities. And we'll see that at the end of, um, well, towards the end of the 20th century, uh, Adventists did engage in organizing religious institutions for the first time in the battle against tobacco interests. And um, so they can, this strain of Adventism, this understanding of what is health, what is disease? What is healing? Has spanned from the beginning uh, right up until this time. So let me um, 
uh, indicate to you how social reform was there at the very beginning of Seventh-day Adventists. There's a professor, R. Lawrence Moore, who's written a book, Religious Outsiders and the Making of Americans, who says that there's evidence, quite a bit of evidence, quite a lot of evidence, that America before the Civil War was overwhelmingly on the side of proving a connection between Christ's imminent return and energetic efforts to perfect this world. Now, this may not seem terribly um, controversial to you. Actually, it is quite controversial, or it was when he said it. Because people have assumed that throughout the history of Christianity, those people who took seriously the return of Christ, and certainly the Seventh-day Adventists, the early Seventh-day Adventists, did that, and the Adventists continue to make that central to their faith. There were Christians who, was, who felt that in the face of this great cosmic battle between God and evil powers, what will they do? They will hunker down and let God fight the devil, right? And there were people who did that throughout the history of Christianity. But there were other people who went the opposite way. And so you have Anabaptists who fought against those powers that they thought were not allowing them the freedom to worship God as they felt that they should. There were groups in the 17th century in um, Britain, what is now the United Kingdom, what was England, uh, who were Calvinists, and they really believed that the Lord was coming and uh, that they should uh, resist those forces that were uh, unjust and that were oppressive. And so the most uh, convinced that the Lord was coming soon were among those who were the most radical in resisting uh, what they saw as oppressive forces uh, in Britain in the 17th century. And so it has gone. And it was the case, as uh, Lawrence Moore has said, that before the Civil War, already, there were groups who were expecting the Lord to return who were also uh, energetic in their attempts to make this nation, uh, particularly the United States, uh, more perfect. A place where um, quite a few of these people emerged from was the Christian Connection. Now, it wasn't a large group, but uh, they, send, they, they were people who attended very carefully to what the Bible said. They believed that whatever the Bible said should exist now, and they felt that that included waiting for the Lord to return, yes, as the Bible said, but it also meant they should be involved in society. Some of the people that we've mentioned that belonged to the Christian connection who became Sabbatarian Adventists included Joseph Bates, James White's father, and then James White himself, and Uriah Smith. All of these people were part of what had been, what, what was a group that was quite radical within the general Baptist community of, uh, of America. They tended to be rebels against all kinds of elites. The elites who said that they knew what the Bible said they, on the other hand, were ordinary people, and they felt that they knew what the Bible would say, would say and did say. They were, among other things, rebels against elite traditional medicine. One example was Elias Smith, the founder of the Christian Connection, who founded a, a magazine that he said was the first religious magazine in America, and notice the title, Herald of Gospel Liberty. Herald. Adventist Review and Herald. Um, another one was Joshua V. Himes. He was a pastor of the Christian Connection and uh, was head of the Clarendon Street Chapel in Boston. Now this became a very active congregation that brought together people who believed in Scripture and what it said with those who were for social reform. Himes became a temperance lecturer. He established a school that helped boys learn a trade so that they could put themselves through 
uh, and education. He participated in the movements, in, in different social movements, including those for women's rights, for world peace, and against slavery. He was a supporter of William Lloyd Garrison. Now, William Lloyd Garrison is the name we're going to be talking about quite a bit. He was the most famous anti-slavery abolitionist leader in the United States. He was particularly active in Boston, and um, he uh, ended up being a friend of Abraham Lincoln. Now, um, Himes found that he not only supported Garrison, but he would participate in the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. He became president of the Young Men's Anti-Slavery Society. Now, this Joshua V. Himes, who was active on all of these social reform movements, including uh, being an ally of William Lloyd Garrison, met William Miller in 1839. Uh, indeed, he invited William Miller in uh, December uh, of 1839 to come to his Clarendon Street Chapel and to lecture. And he was very taken with William Miller, so that by the early part of 1840, in the spring, he, Joshua V. Himes, had already brought out the first uh, issue of the Signs of the Times. These, these people who were part of the Christian connection uh, were obviously, um, how do I say this, on the cusp of, the, of, the, of a revolution of distribution of religious literature. It was as though they were the ones who used the Internet first for uh, communicating religious ideas and social reform ideas. In October of 1840, Himes brought together a conference of Millerites. And from 1840 to 1844, for four years, Joshua V. Himes, a uh, son of the Christian Connection, a member of the Christian Connection, a person who was one of the most prominent members of the Christian Connection, and of religious uh, people. In 1850, the United States uh, Congress, the federal government, adopted a law that tried to appease the North and the South by saying, well, um, we will have a Fugitive Slave Act which means that if some slave in the South escapes from the master, uh, that person's master, and gets into a state where there is no slavery, when that person is found, then that person has to be returned from a northern free state back to the master in the South where there is slavery, and returned to the master. Well, up until then, it was easier for the North to lead its own life and to treat black people as they wished. And, you know, there were people who had free blacks around them. Uh, there were slaves in different places. But this law said that the entire North was legally required to return freed slaves or escaping slaves back to their master. And so it said, those of you in the North that are opposed to slavery, even those who are opposed to slavery, not everybody opposed slavery, but those who are opposed to slavery, you are legally bound to become a collaborator in the institution of slavery. And the North began disobeying this law, this this law of the whole United States. And that's when people started getting involved in helping slaves to escape. Now, there's some debate as to the extent to which Sabbatarian Adventists were involved in it, uh, but um, some of them probably were. Um, but certainly, that U.S. Uh, Fugitive Slave Act was something that inflamed Ellen White. And um, she said in 1850, the law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. Uh, this, is a, <laughs> this is a federal law, 
and she's saying, disobey it. Now, that was what abolitionists were saying, but it wasn't what everybody was saying. And later, uh, a century later, uh, and more, in the 60, 1960s and 70s, um, the civil rights movement was very careful not to oppose federal statutes, but to oppose local statutes. But she said, disobey this federal law. Um, and she also said in 1850 to a Sabbatarian member uh, in the Midwest uh, that she'd heard uh, was uh, endorsing slavery, you must yield your views or the truth. Both, your views or the truth, cannot be cherished in the same heart, for they are at war with each other. This person was embodying the conflict of the great controversy. Unless you undo what you have done, we must let it be known that we have no such ones in our fellowship, that we will not walk with them in church capacity. She is, before there is a general conference, because there is no official Seventh-day Adventist church, she is excommunicating this person. Now, she was not alone. Ellen White was a part of uh, a group of people who had come out of particularly uh, New England and then uh, upper New York State, so that in 1851, a year after Ellen White was saying this, Jane Andrews, in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, the official church uh, uh, journal, uh, had a series of two articles on Revelation 13.11. Let me read that, Revelation 13.11, to you, if I may. Because he's looking at one verse, and he writes two articles on it. Then I saw another beast that rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So this is a, a beast that has two horns, that speaks like a lamb, but then spoke like a lamb. I mean, it, it, two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Sorry, it had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. All right. Now, what does it mean, he said, that there are two horns like a lamb? Well, one horn is Republican civil power. One horn is Republican civil power. And that's good, right? And this uh, little, this one horn is a commitment to the grand principle that all men are born free and equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, this animal, this lamb-like creature, is the United States of America, right? And he said it's mild like a lamb, and it has a lot of energy like a lamb, and both of those are like the United States of America. Republican civil power. But there's a second horn. And what is the second horn? Well, the second horn is Protestantism, and that's good, too, because this animal is like a lamb, which is good, mild, and also energetic, and young, like the United States. And what's the identification of Protestantism? Well, the right of private judgment in matters of conscience, and was there anything in the world like this country um, with its lamb-like professions. So, two horns like a lamb. That's good. But then there's something bad about this creature that is in the, found in the book of Revelation, according to uh, Jan Andrews, who was a young, well-educated, Sabbath-keeping Adventist who was one of the, became one of the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and after whom one of our universities is named. So this animal uh, was like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. How so? Well, Republican civil power, one of the horns, has been twisted so that the U.S. holds three million slaves. And the other horn, which represented Protestantism, is Protestantism's powerful religious bodies approving of slavery and supporting the government. All right? 
So this is a, a creature with two horns that are good, but this animal becomes a beast that speaks like a dragon because Republican civil power has of humanity and the salvation of the country demand. It must be from an infatuation akin to that which of old brought Pharaoh to an untimely end. Now, what in the world was it that so exercised the editor of the Sabbatarian Adventist one year before we became a denomination? It was because the abolitionists were attacking Lincoln because he said in his second inaugural, as he had said in the campaign uh, that led to his presidency, to his being elected as president, was that he opposed the South in order to unite the nation. And when war came, he said he was conducting the war to unite the nation, to save the Union, not, he explicitly said not, to abolish slavery. And Uriah Smith excoriated him and said that he was like Pharaoh. And his fate would be that of Pharaoh. And indeed, in two and a half years, uh, Lincoln was dead. Now, in addition to Uriah Smith, in 1864, J. N. Andrews wrote an article on slavery. And one of the interesting things was that J. N. Andrews uh, responded to those Sabbatarian Adventists, and by now they were Seventh-day Adventists officially. He responded to those who said, well, it was one thing, you know, to be opposed to oppression, but it was another thing to get so involved in politics that you opposed policies of the United States government that you felt uh, were not strong enough in opposing slavery. And so you, if you did that, if you wrote about it, then you were involved in politics. And indeed, um, during the Civil War and after the Civil War, the official church paper reprinted many articles by radical Republican writers. That is to say, the most radical of the Republicans, uh, who were the northern, it was the northern party that opposed um, slavery, and they, those who defended slavery tended to be Democrats at that time. So, Jan Andrews writes a very clever article, a very move, I mean, it's a very biting, sarcastic article about these people within his community, his religious community, who are opposed to this activism against slavery. He says this, this sin is, a, is snugly stowed away in a certain package, which is named politics. Now, obviously, he doesn't think that, that what he's doing is a sin, but he says that's what people say. Snugly stowed away in a certain package which is labeled politics. These people deny the right of their fellow men to condemn any of the favorite sins which they have placed in this bundle. And they evidently expect that any parcel bearing this label will pass the final custom house, that is, the judgment of the great day, without being examined. Should the all-seeing judge, however, inquire into their connection with this great iniquity. They suppose the following answer will be entirely satisfactory to him. I am not censurable for anything said or done by me in behalf of slavery. For, O Lord, thou knowest, it was a part of my politics. So notice what is being done here. One of the leaders of the Sabbatarian Adventists, who have now become Seventh-day Adventists, is saying, of course we're going to condemn this, and we don't care if people say that that's politics. So, that's the attitude of the Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists now. Uh, in the 1870s on into the 90s, Ellen White wanted the churches to participate in expanding what the government was doing in helping the freedmen to, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, establish sanitariums, construct schools, and organize industries to employ the freedmen. In 1894, Edson White, the oldest son of James and Ellen White, who had been reading these admonitions of his mother, decided to do something. He, after all, was the son of James White, 
quite an entrepreneur who had started these various publications for the Sabbatarian Adventists and convinced that community to create the Seventh-day Adventist denomination officially. So this son created a steamer, a small steamer that he called the Morning Star, and sailed it down the Mississippi River. He took it to St. Louis, Missouri, Cairo, Illinois, Memphis, Tennessee, and on down into the Mississippi, uh, flowing by the state of Mississippi to Vicksburg, where there had been a huge battle in the Civil War where Grant defeated the South. It was a very bloody battle, but he sailed down there and then on to Yazoo City in Mississippi, which is the heart of the Mississippi Delta, which is where there were so many uh, black slaves that were uh, employed <laughs> who were using, being used to grow cotton for the whole nation. And what did he do with this, um, this little steamer, the Morning Star? Well, on board he held worship services and he invited people of different races to come on board and participate in these worship services. He conducted classes, prophetic interpretation classes. He had classes on reading and writing. He also cl had classes on diversification of um, crops so that the black people could learn to break the hold of King Cotton and if they had a little bit of property, they could r learn how to raise chickens, grow peanuts, strawberries, tomatoes, cabbages, and care for bees, for pity's sakes. And he also taught them temperance and how to lead healthier lives. He also wrote a book called The Coming King that sold 75,000 copies that helped to uh, the finance of this project, and also printed something called the Gospel Herald. He was a white, he edited a journal, he started it, and that was a moneymaker also for this project. By 1909, he'd come down there in 1894, by 1909 there were two medical institutions that had been established, one in Nashville, Tennessee, and another in Atlanta, Georgia. There were 55 schools in 10 states for the black children, and there were 1,800 black students enrolled. So what we see here is a community that understood that their battle between Satan and God, between God and Satan, was translated into their own time in participation in the great issues of their time. And nothing, nothing was more dominant than this issue of slavery. It was an economic issue a political issue, a moral issue, and certainly uh, one that split the country. And they felt that it was their task. And it wasn't just that they ought to do it, but they were enthusiastic about being involved in this issue. We'll be seeing in subsequent uh, sessions that this involvement extended into the 20th century and into the 21st century. But it's certainly here among the founders in the 19th century, uh, coming up to the turn of the century. And here, disease is understood as clashing of good and evil. And what is health? Health is the restoration of that conflict and that controversy into some sort of uh, civil harmony, uh, an ideal society, at least an approximation of it, what the Quakers called um, the peaceable kingdom. And healing is the battling of those forces that do not allow uh, the weak to flourish, that do not allow justice to exist as strongly as it should, and that that is a diseased society which must be healed. I'd like to close with a passage from the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. And this is the key passage of the Bible for this metaphor that we're dealing with here and that we will continue in the next couple of sessions. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, 
flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. This is a picture of Eden restored as a city. Through the middle of the street of the, uh, the street of the city, on either side of the river, is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing, in uh, uh, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And so this this idea of healing for these people uh, understood as a community that was engaged with the larger community around them. This form of healing necessitates engaging the powers of oppression. And we'll see what that, how that was done in the weeks to come. See you next time.